Hello, and welcome to RHP. What we're going to be doing for a while is reading books. I've got so many books like this one, many books, and uh, I don't think I've read any of them. And they just take up a lot of space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read them, and at the end, throw them in the garbage. Clear the place out. Now hopefully I'll get smarter by the end, but I'll probably get dumber. So we'll see how that goes. Book one. Traditional tool making. Ah, see if we can get through some of those books. Modern tool making methods. Chapter one. Precision locating and dividing methods. The degree of accuracy that is necessary in the construction of certain classes of machinery and tools has made it necessary for toolmakers and machinists to employ various methods and appliances for locating holes or finished services to given dimensions and within the prescribed limits of accuracy. In this chapter, Various approved methods of locating work, such as are used more particularly in tool rooms, are described and illustrated. Button method of accurately locating work. Among the different methods employed by tool makers for accurately locating work, such as jigs, etc., on the faceplate of a lathe, one of the most commonly used is known as the button method. This method is so named because cylindrical pushings or buttons are attached to the work in positions corresponding to the holes to be bored, after which they are used in locating the work. These buttons, which are ordinarily about a half or five-eighths of an inch in diameter, are ground and lapped to the same size. And the ends are finished perfectly square. The outside diameter should preferably be such that the radius can easily be determined. And the hole through the center should be about an eighth of an inch larger than the retaining screw. So that the button can be adjusted laterally. Damn, there's a lot of noise out here. <laughs> As a simple example of the practical application of the button method. Suppose three holes are to be bored in a jig plate according to the dimensions given in figure one. A common method of procedure would be as follows. First lay out the centers of all holes to be bored. By the usual method, mark these centers with a prick punch and then drill holes for the machine screws which are used to clamp the buttons. After the buttons are clamped lightly in place, set them in correct relation with each other and with the jig plate. The proper location of the buttons is very important as their positions largely determine the accuracy of the work. The best method of locating a number of buttons depends somewhat upon their relative positions, the instruments available, and the accuracy required. Oh, yeah. When buttons must be located at given distances from the finished sides of a jig, a surface plate and veneer height gauge are often used. The method is to place that side from which the button is to be set upon an accurate surface plate and then set the button by means of the height gauge. Allowance being made, of course, for the radius of the button. The center to center distance between the different buttons can afterwards be verified by taking direct measurements with a micrometer, as indicated in figure two. By measuring the overall distance and deducting 
the diameter of one button. After the buttons have been set and the screws are tightened, all measurements should be carefully checked. The work is then mounted on the faceplate of the lathe and one of the buttons is set true by the use of a test indicator. When the dial of the indicator ceases to vibrate, thus showing that the button runs true, the latter should be removed so that the hole can be drilled and bored to the required size. In a similar manner, other buttons are indicated and the holes bored one at a time. It is evident that if each button is correctly located and set perfectly true in the lathe, the various holes will be located the various holes will be located the required distance apart within very close limits. Another example of work illustrating the application of the button method is shown in figure three. All right, so we got three pictures so far. The disc shaped part illustrated is a flange template which formed a part of a fixture for drilling holes in flange plates. The holes being located on a circle six inches in diameter, it was necessary to space the six holes <coughs> equidistantly so that the holes in the flanges would match in any position, thus making them interchangeable. First, a plug was turned so that it fitted snugly in the inch and a, let's see, one and a, one and a quarter inch central hole of the plate and projected above the top surface about three quarters of an inch. A center was located in this plug and from it a circle. All right, let me show you some of these pictures. Not too many and they're pretty shitty. There's one. There's the other one. There's the third one. As the barber go by. Uh, of three inches radius was drawn. This circle was divided into six equal parts. And then small circles, five eighths inch in diameter, were drawn to indicate the outside circumference of the bushings to be placed in the holes. These circles served as a guide when setting the button and enabled the work to be done much more quickly. The centers of the holes were next carefully prick punched and small holes were drilled and tapped for number 10 machine screws. After this, the six buttons were attached in approximately the correct positions and the screws tightened enough to hold the buttons firmly but allow them to be moved by tapping lightly. As the radius of the circle is three inches, the radius of the central plug five eighths of an inch and that of each button five sixteenths inch, the distance from the outside of the central plug to the outside of any button when correctly set, must be 3 and 15 sixteenths inches. Since there are six buttons around the circle, the center to center distance is equal to the radius, and the distance between the outside or any two buttons should be 3 and 5 eighths inches. Having determined these dimensions, each button is set equidistant from the central plug and the required distance apart by using a micrometer. As each button is brought into its correct position, it should be tightened down a little so that it will be located firmly when finally set. The work is then strapped to the faceplate of a lathe and each button is indicated for boring the different holes by means of an indicator as previously described. 
damn, I'm only four pages in. I'm already bored out of my fucking mind. I don't know if I'm going to make it through one chapter of this damn book before I throw this son of a bitch in the garbage. When the buttons are removed, it'll be found that in nearly all cases, the small screw holes will not run exactly true. Therefore, it is advisable to form a true starting point for the drill by using a lathe tool. When doing precision work of this kind, the degree of accuracy obtained will depend upon the instruments used, the judgment and skill of the workmen, and the care exercised. A good general rule to follow when locating bushings or buttons is to use the method which is the most direct and which requires the least number of measurements in order to prevent an accumulation of errors. Okay. Locating work by the disk method. The last one was the button method, this the disk method now. Comparatively, small precision work is sometimes located by the disk method, which is the same in principle as the button method. The chief difference being that disks are used instead of buttons. These discs are made to such diameters that when their peripheries are in contact, each disc center will coincide with the position of the hole to be bored. The centers are then used for locating the work. To illustrate this method, suppose that the master plate shown at the left in figure four is to have three holes, A, B, and C, bored into it to the center distances given. It is first necessary to determine the diameters of the disks. If the center distances between all the holes were equal, the diameters would, of course, equal this dimension. When, however, the distances between the centers are unequal, the diameters may be found as follows. Subtract, say, dimension Y from X, thus obtaining the difference between the radii of disk C, of disks C, and A. See right-hand sketch. And this difference to dimension Z, and the result will be the diameter of disk A. Dimension Z and the result will be the diameter of disk A. Okay. Dividing if I look away I'll lose my space. Oh God. Dividing this diameter by two gives the radius which subtracted from center distance X equals the radius of B. Similarly the radius of B subtracted from dimension Y equals the radius of C. For example, 0 0.930 minus 0 0.720 equals 0 0.210, or the difference between the radii of this C and A. Then the diameter of A equals 0 0.210 plus 0 0.860 equals 1.070 inch, and the radius equals 1.070 divided by 2 equals 0.0. 535 five inch. The radius of B equals 0 0.930 minus 0 0.535 equals 0.395 inch and 0.395 times 2 equals 0 0.790 or the diameter of B. The center distance it sounds too complicated. Yeah, I know. It's crazy, right? 0 0.720 minus 0 0.395 equals 0 0.325, which is the radius of C. 0 0.325 times 2 equals 0 0.650, or the, dis uh, the diameter of C. After determining the diameters, the disc should be turned nearly to size and finished, preferably in a bench lathe. First, insert a solder chuck in the spindle. Face it, perfectly true. And attach the disc by a few drops of solder. Being careful to hold the 
worked firmly against the chuck while soldering. Face the outer side and cut a sharp V center in it. Then grind the periphery to the required diameter. Next, fasten the finished discs onto the work in their correct locations with their peripheries in contact and then set one of the discs exactly central with the lathe. And here's some of the pictures. Yeah. Not much. I, I don't see how you can learn anything by reading a book. I mean, uh, not to mention it's boring as shit, but... Uh, Seems impossible. I mean, on, on the job training would be the easiest thing, right? Oh, hell yeah. Let's see. Next, pass into this, into the work. Uh, exactly central to the lead. Spindle by applying a test indicator to the center in the disc. After removing the disc and boring the hole, the work is located for boring the other holes in the same manner. That's, this is why I never finished a book at all. I mean, yeah. come on. We're only on page six, and I'm bored out of my freaking mind. There's no way you can learn any of this bullshit from a book. Yeah. Small discs may be secured to the work by means of jeweler's wax. This is, supposed, uh, this is composed of common rosin and plaster of Paris and is made as follows. Heat the rosin in a vessel until it flows freely, and then add plaster of Paris and keep stirring the mixture. Care should be taken not to make the mixture too stiff. When it appears to have the proper consistency, pour some of it onto a slate or marble slab and allow it to cool. Then insert the point of a knife under the flattened cake thus formed and try to pry it off. If it springs off with a slight metallic ring, the proportions are right. But if it is gummy and ductile, there is too much rosin. On the other hand, if it is too brittle and crumbles, this indicates that there is too much plaster of Paris. The wax should be warmed before using. A mixture of beeswax and shellac, or beeswax and rosin, in about equal proportions, is also used for holding discs in place. When the latter are fairly large, it may be advisable to secure them with small screws, provided the screw holes are not objectionable. Objectionable? What the hell? Disc and button method of locating holes. The accuracy of work done by the button method previously described is limited only by the skill and painstaking care of the workman. But setting the buttons requires a great deal of time. By a little modification, using what is sometimes called the disc and button method, a large part of this time can be saved without any sacrifice of accuracy. The disc and button method, which was described by Guy H. Gardner in Machinery, September 1914, is extensively used in many shops. Buttons are used, but they are located in the centers of discs whatever diameters are necessary to give the required locations. As the discs are used in each step of the process, it is sometimes called the three disc method. To illustrate the practical application of this method, Suppose six equally spaced holes are to be located in the circumference of a circle six inches in diameter. To locate these, one needs besides the buttons three discs three inches in diameter, each having a central hole exactly fitting the buttons. It is best to have also a bushing of the same diameter as the buttons which has a center punch fitted to slide in it. First, the center button is screwed to the template and one of the discs, A, figure 5, is slipped over it. Then a second disc, B, carrying a bushing and center punch is placed in contact with the disc, A, and a light below on the punch marks the place to drill and tap for number 2 button, which is kept in its proper place 
while tightening the screw by holding the two discs A and B in contact. Next, the third disc C is placed in contact with disc A and B and locates number three button and so on until the seven buttons are secured in position. The template is then ready to be strapped to the, the lathe face plate for boring. Oh, Jesus. Now we're on to page nine. I don't know. I got to take a break. This is bullshit. Yeah. We'll see you on the next one. So I haven't even got through, what, eight pages only. And there's no way you can learn anything from a book. I mean, come on. And, and the pictures, they suck. Yeah. I mean, you really need to have, like, a, you know, a machinist train oh, you. Yeah. Hands-on training. I, I, there's no other way to learn things. I, I, I don't understand these, but why do I keep buying these pieces of crap? I don't know. Ugh. It just makes you. Throw it in the garbage. I just don't know. But we'll try to get through more of it later. I, I'm just too bored right now. See you later.